talk about fears well, Let's talk about Welcome to uh, Monday. So Monday is solved or unsolved and a start of a new week on Unsolved No More. Uh, this week we're going to be looking at the quote unquote yogurt shop murders. Um, I chose this one because I have a lot of elements I feel that we can use. It's a convoluted case in a way, but I think I want to break it down and make it a lot simpler than what it is. Uh, I heard about this case before and it's been requested a lot but I remember watching this I believe it was on Unsolved Mysteries a long time ago and I have a pretty good uh, memory at least up until recently with, <laughs> with age I guess um, but I still recall certain things and certain things stick with me and this is one of them. So for you that are not familiar this happened in Austin Texas on December 6 1991 and it's a quadruple murder um, it was inside a uh, a business called uh, no something yogurt I can't remember the name of the actual business but they were it was a yogurt shop and Four people, as I mentioned, were murdered. Um, I got it written down here. The two workers were Jennifer Harbison, who was 17, Aliza Thomas, who was 17. They were working that night, and they were getting ready to close. They got accompanied that night by Sarah Harbison, who was 15, who was Jennifer's sister, who was working, and her friend Amy Ayers, who was 13. Those two had come. They had been shopping. This business was located in a strip mall. It's very important. Uh, the location of the of the business. It's going to tell us something and lead us to uh, a probable offender, along with a lot of other things. But basically, what happened was, um, they were a fire broke out in that business a patrol officer was nearby he saw it and called the fire department got on scene and they discovered the four bodies in the back they were nude they had been shot in the head apparently execution style i want to get into that a little bit more uh, later when i look into this because the manner of death how they were shot uh, is all important when you're trying to uh, use a crime scene assessment and determine what type of individual committed this crime. Now, in this case, there isn't a lot of evidence. But the crime scene will tell you a lot. They were apparently bound and gagged. And now, I will research this further. As you guys know, they've been with me for a while. Monday's Solved or Unsolved is basically a, a generic overview of the case. I'm still in the midst of doing my research. I've researched this for a couple of days, read some appeals of, of trial transcripts and, and such, looked at a couple crime scene photos that I could get my hands on, and I haven't dug down deep into this. And what I mean by that is when I say they were bound and gagged, Okay, well, I need to know with what. I need to know how. 
I need to know if knots were used. Um, meticulous findings like that is very important. It's not good enough just to know they were bound. It's not just good enough to know they were gagged. I got to know with what. Were items brought into the shop? Was it used with items from the shop? In this case, I have read that it was with their own clothing. But, as always, the source of where you get this information from. An example, the first thing I've written down in my notes is lighter fluid, question mark. Because one of the initial reports that I had read had said they were doused with lighter fluid and set on fire. That's the very first thing I've written down here because that tells you a lot. Who, who has lighter fluid, you know, on hand? Well, number one, okay, well, maybe it's somebody that is a camper, that camps a lot, is an outdoorsman. Or it shows premeditation. Hey, they were coming here to set a fire. But the more I read, there's no indication that lighter fluid was ever used. So, again, you have to be very, very careful of the information you get and where you get it from. This is That's a prime example of that. Um, DNA, in this case, is going to play a role. Again, it appears that two people were raped. Now, I want to know... And DNA was recovered years later. I, I got to get the factual information from that and the source. Were they raped and which ones were raped? That's important as well. There was an arrest in this case. There was a confession in this case. This case reminds me a lot on the onset of the West Memphis Three, in a way. I read the confessions uh, very meticulously today. That, I'll leave it at that. Again, there was an arrest. There was a, a conviction of two out of the four suspects. Them being uh, Michael Scott and Robert Springsteen, they went on trial. Two other people, Maurice Pierce and Forrest Wellborn, were never brought to trial. Um, but the two that went to trial were found guilty, but they got out on appeals. And again, that doesn't mean they're innocent. They weren't released because of exculpatory evidence. They were released on legal appeals. It's important to look at all of this, okay? As the week goes on, especially Wednesday, I'll get into the confession part of it, for sure. We'll dissect that. The DNA. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to tell you guys a lot about DNA that you may not know or that you may know. Just because you have DNA or or you read somewhere that there's DNA available doesn't, you know, think of the John Benet Ramsey case. Everyone gets hung up that well DNA was found in John Benet's underwear, but it wasn't linked to anybody, the family or anybody else. So, therefore, the family didn't do it. That's not true. If you believe that, then you're just being ignorant to DNA. As I discussed before, there is case study, experimental studies done, where you can extract DNA from a brand new pair of underwear. And you can trace it back to the factory workers. That is the... I hate to say problem with DNA, but it is a problem. Everyone thinks DNA is this great um, crime solving, you know, luxury that police have. And it is. But technology has advanced so much that it is picking up DNA that isn't even relevant to the crime. 
Therefore, it throws certain reasonable doubt into the prosecution if they ever arrest anybody. Is that the case here? I don't know because I have to do some more digging because I don't know where this DNA come from and that's bothering me. There's YSTR DNA in this case. YSTR DNA is through the male side of the genes. Therefore, it's not all inclusive. You could get a match from a YSTR crime scene and it could match a couple thousand people or more than that. It's a start. It, it certainly helps and I think you can certainly you can eliminate but I need to know okay where this YSTR is coming from it's much like the Sherry Joe Bates murder that from the Zodiac case you know at one point in time um, we had our own lab when I was uh, running ASOC and I had set up a DNA lab with Susanna Ryan and she's the one who did our DNA and the DNA we got off of the, the offender's watch and also the victim's pants had YSTR DNA. Sorry about that. I need that Pete's coffee in the morning. Pete's, come on, man. You got to sponsor me as much as I'm eating or drinking your coffee. Sometimes it feels like I'm eating it because it's, it's pretty thick and heavy, but I love my dark roast coffee. Anyway, I digress. Um, so why STR? I need to know what it is. If the victims were raped, I need to know whether that DNA is semen. I need to know whether it's blood. I need to know whether it's touch. Oh, that's very important. Where was that DNA found? That's paramount. Was it found on the bindings? Was it found in a rape kit? How badly were these bodies burned? You have to remember, uh, they were shot, presumably raped. I haven't seen any evidence of that yet. Set on fire. And then the fire company comes in with the water and that destroys a lot of evidence. But, you know, those fire hoses are so powerful, it could even move the positioning of the bodies if you think about it. So, again, it's a very convoluted case, but I think this case, for me, is going to come down to criminal profiling, and I think that's what I'm going to do for this case. I will get into the DNA, into the confessions. I will not get into too much of the legal aspects of it. But I think there's enough there in order to do a, a good criminal profile of this person or persons who committed this crime. Uh, I think I'll use crime scene assessment, pictures, all those things in order to come up with a good profile, good crime scene assessment of who would have more than likely committed this crime. And if it matches the people that were arrested then eventually let go. This is a big case, especially in Texas. And the reason I say it reminds me of West Memphis 3 is because the confession, you know, people say, why, why would somebody confess to something they didn't do? Listen, we can second guess things all we want until you're in that situation. And even if you are in that situation, you say to yourself you would never confess to something you didn't do. But it happens. And just because you wouldn't do something doesn't mean somebody else wouldn't do something. Everybody reacts differently to a different situation. Think of last week in the Darley Routier case, or two weeks ago, um, in the Silly String video. Everybody gets so bent out of shape about that. But you don't know, you know, she reacts differently to grief than other people or whatever it is. So I don't go off of that. You go off of facts. You go off of the DNA. You go off of the location of the bodies, where the bodies moved. 
um, the bindings, eyewitness statements, you know, all that stuff obviously is crucial in determining, you know, who the offender or offenders are. I'm fairly confident in this. I think there's enough there that I'm able to do a, a good criminal profile on this. I haven't done a, a criminal profile in a while, and <clears throat> the reason being is it's just a tool. Criminal profiling is nothing more than a tool. I read one on the Martha Moxley case that the FBI did, and one uh and and uh, there's no bigger um, fan of FBI criminal profiling than me. I mean, I worked with Jim Clemente, uh, Mark Safarik, um, you know, shared some emails with John Douglas. Read, you know, obviously all of John Douglas's books when I was younger. Um, Bob Ressler and Mary Ellen O'Toole. I mean, you know, I'm fairly decent friends with her, and we worked together on Hunt for the Zodiac case and coming up with a profile for the Zodiac killer. So I, I'm a big fan of theirs. Even uh, Richard Walters from the VDOC Society, I mean, he's the one that kind of got me started in all this. And when I went to his house, oh, probably 10 years ago, you know, we went through his methodology, which is different than the FBI's for criminal profiling, but I still learned from it. And he was very gracious, and uh, I respect him very much. So... I was able to take that, and then, of course, I went for my master's degree, and I was studying criminal profiling uh, there, but again, it's a tool. It's It won't solve your case for you, and I think the FBI will tell you that, but I get back to the Martha Moxley case where they had stated uh, that the person that committed that crime... Was in, I think it said that it was, they were intoxicated. Or they didn't have a job. Might have been both. And I can't get behind that. Because I don't know where that's coming from. I don't, I don't know how you can determine that. To me, that goes a little bit too far in your criminal profiling. I don't think there's anything done at that crime scene, I'm speaking of Martha Moxley, that you could deduce that the person doesn't have a job. Possibly you'd be able to deduce that they were intoxicated, but I still don't see that. Um, so to me, that pushes it a little bit too far. Now, if they can explain to me how they come up with that, I certainly am all ears, but when I do it, I'll explain w w why. If I say the person that committed this Austin yogurt shop murder is a white male juvenile. You can't just arbitrarily say that and then move on and give the rest of your assessment. Why? That's what's important. Too many people just throw out arbitrary things when they do criminal profiling. Some of them aren't even... They're not qualified to do that. Um, so, if I say that it's a white male juvenile, well, I have to tell you why. I can say, well, it's based on the geographic population of that area. There is no black males in the area. And it's a juvenile because of the time of night. Now, I'm just making this up, but I'm just illustrating <clears throat> how you have to back your criminal profile up by facts. So I, I think I will be able to do that in this case, and it will help, I believe, point towards the offender. Um, what else do I want to look at? The crime scene, I said the crime scene assessment, looking at the photographs that you can find. Victimology, obviously, is going to be paramount. We have to 
look into all four girls and find out, hey, was there any, any enemies? You know, to me, this case really, right off the bat, I know it's convoluted, and I said that. But right off the bat, after looking at it for a day, it's simple. Sometimes you don't have to go down all those rabbit holes and get caught up in certain things. Focus on the evidence, what's there, the victimology, the suspect knowledge, the means, the motive, the opportunity, um, the crime scene assessment, the DNA, the evidence. That's where my focus is. Don't broaden it and don't start going down rabbit holes. Stick with the simple explanation, what happened, this is what happened, this is more than likely who's responsible, and move on. So this week, that's what I hope to do for you. So solved or unsolved, this is certainly unsolved, um, without a doubt. And by the end of the week, I'll let you know what I think. Tomorrow, I'm going to do my key clue. Now remember, a key clue is something that I was reading, something I saw that immediately was like, ooh, that's important. Okay, I'm going to give you that Tuesday. Wednesday will be the deep dive. And we'll get into all this. You know, everybody loves the deep dive. And we work up to that. And then Thursday we'll do the live chat. And Friday I'll answer your questions and your comments. And we'll move on to another case. So that's going to be it for, uh, for today. Solved or unsolved, the yogurt shop murders, definitely unsolved. So I'll see you Tuesday. And uh, we'll go there for Ken's Key Clue. Okay. Main. I won't fear us.